In this video, we are going to talk about singular value decompositions. It's the second of my videos on singular value decompositions. The first one went over in detail the singular value decomposition. This one talks about applications, and I'm going to go over three. Because the first two are so straightforward, I'm going to dispense with the overview slide. So the first two are almost really quick, more like descriptions of applications. So the first one is estimation of rank. And the method of counting the number of pivot columns in A to determine the rank does not work well if A is row reduced by a computer due to round off error. In practice, the most reliable way to estimate the rank of a large matrix A is to count the number of non-zero singular values. So our first application is estimation of rank by counting non-zero singular values. The second application is called the condition number and it, again, it has to do with computers and their round-off errors. Most numerical calculations involving an equation AX equals B are reliable as possible when the SVD of A is used. Any possible instabilities in numerical calculations are identified in sigma. So, and by instabilities in numerical calculations, that means places where if you just perturb the solution just a little bit, that all of a sudden your answer will become disproportionately incorrect to how small the system is perturbed. So if A is an invertible n by n matrix, then the ratio of the largest and smallest singular values, sigma 1 over sigma n, gives the condition number of A, which is an indication of sensitivity of the solution of Ax equals B to small changes, or errors, of entries in A. So here, the condition number gives you the sensitivity of the solutions to small errors. And the next application is more involved and we are only going to overview it. So here, it is the getting the bases for the fundamental subspaces and there are four fundamental subspaces. The first is the column space of A, the next is the row space of A, and then there's the null space of A, and last, the null space of A transpose. And the idea is Throughout this course, we've talked about how to get a basis for the column space of A, how to get a basis for the null space of A, and from there you can take the transpose and get the basis for this. And you have all these calculations. If it's a, you know, so the idea now is if you do a singular value decomposition, these bases will fall out fairly easily. In particular, you know, you have your set V and you have your set U. So U1 through UR is going to be an orthonormal basis for the column space of A. UR plus 1 up to UM will be the orthonormal basis for the null space of A transpose. And then you have um, VR plus 1, VR plus 2 up to VN is the orthonormal basis for the null space of A. And V1 up to VR is the orthonormal basis for the row space of A. So from the singular value decomposition, these bases fall out. And not only are they bases, they're all orthonormal bases. So they're nice to work with. And there's this picture here that sort of summarizes it. You have your vectors v1 through vr. And these are the ones associated with the non-zero singular values. And then you have vr plus 1 up to vn associated with the zero singular values. And then over here, we take these vectors, we multiply by a, and you know, following up here from our definition, this is how we you know, defined or um, derived u. u is equal to 1 over sigma avi, which means avi is equal to this sigma times ui over here. So multiplying these vectors by a gives us our uh, singular value times u. Next, we should talk about what happens when these vr plus 1 for, through vn gets multiplied by a. And so I have this written down here. So let's look at vr plus 1 up to vm. When we multiply by a, since these are um, eigenvectors, that's just equal to the eigenvalue times the vector. But here, remember, for um, our sigmas, for our for any sigma i greater than r, these are all associated with the zero. So all of these get mapped to zero. And here in the picture, all of the vr plus 1 through vn, they all map to zero. But remember, so that's this portion of the picture, but do remember that we extended u to form an orthonormal basis for rm. So here's the extension here. 
And then here on the outside, it tells us what each of these sets of vectors is a basis for. So V1 through Vr is a basis for the row space of A, which is what exactly what this part here tells us. The Vr plus 1 through Vn is the basis for the null space of A, which is over here, the result over here. Our singular values times U1 up to Ur is a basis for the column space of A, which is this statement here. And then down here, our ur plus 1 to um is a basis for the null space of A transpose. That's this point here. And another thing here in this picture, um, the row space of A is perpendicular to the null space of A. That's what these um, little brackets are supposed to kind of suggest, a 90 degree angle. And here, the column space of A is perpendicular to the null of A transpose. I'd given some thought to how much time I wanted to spend proving this, and I do have the outline. This one here is proved, uh, proved in uh, the last chapter, but these three are new proofs. There's an outline that I have here from your book, but I found when I went through these, I actually had to fill in a lot of steps. So I think for now, in the interest of time, and again, not time about this video, but time before the exam, I'm going to leave these without proof. That said, this last application, the basis for the fundamental spaces, does give us these four additions to the invertible matrix theorem. So A is in an invertible matrix if and only if the orthogonal complement of column space of A is equal to the zero vector, the orthogonal complement of the null space of A is equal to Rn, the row of A is equal to Rn, and A has n non-zero singular values. So that's it for this video. Good luck on your final. Thank you for watching.